Good evening, I am Matterall. Tonight on Talking in Stations, a major fight breaks out in 49 Tech U over a Fortizar. Super carrier casualties, mostly on the Imperium side. We'll look at that. Ignoitan invaded by Triglavians. And this is a major landing port for jump freighters. And there is uh, the Tranquility Rebel Tower. So we'll see how the owner of that tower, Vili, reacts. And finally, another battle in 9CG6, TAC-H. That one's over Faction Fortazars. We'll take a look at that as well. Those stories and more on TIS Today, the EVE Online Report. Let's get started. How are you doing, Maddox? How are you doing good? Gregorin? Uh, uh, not bad. What about you? I'm great, thanks. Already we have our guest with us today, Vili. How are you doing? Doing great, Mineral. How are you? Really good. First order of business is what we have on screen now. Japanese localization has returned to EVE Online. It will be up and ready to go this winter. What can you tell us about it as a CSM member? Um, well, obviously, they gave us a heads up that it was happening. Uh, they've been working on it for a little bit. Uh, they're just continuing to work on accessibility of the game for players around uh, the world. And obviously, I think everybody can agree it's another positive step forward, uh, opening the game up to more markets, more people, uh, and especially in a time zone that can always use more people. Yeah. We were joking earlier about uh, people complaining about dev time on efforts that CCP is doing, and we thought that localization might be something immune to that criticism. Uh, and you were laughing that, nope, people complain about that too. No, well, I'm sure somebody will find a way to complain. Mm -hmm. Complain that some other, some other language should have been chosen first, or you know those devs should have been uh, reassigned to work on uh, you know lag or something with their language skills. But you know, yeah. Oh, that's true. Sure enough. <laughs> I'll, <laughs> you know. I'll take this opportunity to complain. Like, where's Spanish localization? We want Spanish localization. Eve Echoes has it. There you go. All right. Um, let's go on to other stuff. Uh, there's big news. May, yesterday was a huge fight. Uh, let's have a look at some of the photographs of that. I, need... I don't know if we can. Can you get me URLs to these pictures here? I'll see if oh. I can actually bring one up. Uh, Billy, why don't you tell us what happened yesterday uh, from your perspective as one of the generals up there? All right, so we had the 49U Fortizar Armor Timer. So it's the one of the last structures in the system. Uh, we were previously, uh, a few days before, we had stood down over this timer, like a repeat of this timer, uh, where we had both formed super fleets, and the Imperium had kind of signaled to us that uh, they were willing to go all in on this timer. So we were... Uh, taken a little bit surprised by that and uh you know we had stood down that night because we were still not moved yet so we figured we probably wanted to wait on the all-in for another couple days give ourselves a chance to move supplies in from catch and make sure that if we're actually going to go all in this early that uh we're ready for it um so the timer came out uh imperium came in we came in we had them massively outnumbered in, well i don't know massively we definitely had them significantly well, outnumbered two to one it looked like on paper does that sound right to you i don't know if it was two to one maybe like 1. 1.6 to one 1. 1.8 something like that but you know it, it's a pretty heavy out number in subs uh they had facts with them they set up a standard battle ball in the fort uh and usually when you set up a battle ball in a fort with battleships and facts it means that the only way to really beat that comp is usually through like not this is when you truly need what i what i was calling like a massive outnumbering when you need two to one three to one four to one kind of numbers just because the fax reps on a fortizar are so powerful and usually uh faxes on fortizars have a certain level of immunity because trying to kill them requires an escalation that is uh just much much more committal than people usually want to be on a fortizar uh, but nonetheless, we were ready to go. We instantly committed on their faxes with dreadnoughts. Um, and they committed a little bit, uh, I think 40 or 50 dreads on our dreads. We committed another 70 or 80 or 100 dreads on their dreads. And then they 
uh, committed armor supercarriers to and shield supercarriers to the grid uh, directly on their Fortisar, uh, at which point we committed our armor supercarriers and our shield supercarrier fleets. And, you know, we had the the lookings of this was going to be the true battle. Um, however, uh, as soon as, you know, they jumped in, they had jumped in directly on top of our dread bomb that had been killing their dreads. So we still had 80, 90, 100 dreads there at that point, I think. And I, I think we like almost insta killed one of the Nixes and then another one. Uh, fighter bombers at this point from our armor and shield super fleets are burning down. Uh, the, you know, they're hazing dreads with their fighter bombers. And then at this point, apparently their plan was to utilize the PDS, clear all the bubbles and warp their super carrier fleet off to the friendly keeps on grid. Uh, unfortunately, due to lag, uh, they weren't able to do that. So their supercarrier fleet is stuck there uh, for about an hour in real time. And, uh, you know, they pr- proceed to pretty epically continue to eat shit. Um, <laughs> they, yeah. you know, pick more newsworthy language. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry. Like, uh, you know, they're being destroyed. Uh, they do warp out large chunks of the supercarrier fleet. They are on a Fortizar. You know, it is hard to keep things bubbled there. Uh, eventually, uh, through either tether or warp out or jump out, uh, they eventually get all their supercarriers safe after losing 17 of them, uh, at which point uh, they switch tactics to try to waterboard us on the Fortizar with Dictors to try and allow the Fortizar to kill Dreads with the Fortizar damage. Uh, Works for five, ten minutes, and then somebody remembers that we can just rep the dreads because they're all at a siege. So uh, I think we lose like one or two dreads after that uh, who are just disconnected or like nobody will speak up when they get shot kind of thing. But otherwise, we just rep the dreads, the fort is our shoots, and Imperium uh, suicides roughly 300 uh, sabers at us, oh, yeah. trying to slow us down. Um, and everybody. <laughs> Yeah, it's an impressive feed. Uh and at that point we uh we basically continue killing interdictors for half an hour. Uh when you're getting that many interdictor kills, most people don't mind. And uh then we extract. And that was pretty much the battle. The It felt like uh, over an hour that we I was being my fleet was being waterboarded. Yeah, it wasn't like a short period, it, but it wasn't a long period either, really, in the scheme of things. Looking I think the, the battle was done at like 0500, and I think we were done being waterboarded by like 0545 or something like that. I can't remember the exact times, but like... Yeah, I... It, it was about an hour they they spent suiciding the 300 Dictors, and like, 300 Dictors is like a super carrier worth of interdictors. <laughs> like, it's not some fucking minor, or apologies for my language. It's not some minor, you know, number of dictors. Dictors are quite expensive, especially sabers at their usual 70 or 80 mil zone. So. Yeah, it looked like the estimate was 12 bill isk. So. In what? Interdictors? Yeah. No, it was about 23. Well, the better report out that I'm looking at uh, shows the total losses on the PM side around 800 billion, and you guys uh, on the uh, Pappy side or Viloconda side or whatever you want to name it there, uh, looks like they lost uh, roughly around 400 bill. Does that sound about right? So the final battle report I'm looking at is 387 to 814. Okay, yeah, this is close to what I'm looking at as well. That's still pretty heavy losses on both sides, really, for a uh, armor timer for a Fortizar. Yeah, the Fortizar was irrelevant to the the battle, aside from the tactical advantages provided to the defender. So let's talk uh, about why this did happen. Why did it happen over this Fortizar? The strength check. They thought they could uh, handle the all-in. We thought we could handle the all-in. You know, they uh, they put their cards on the table, and we called. And then they, or we put, they put their cards on the table. We raised, they folded. Yeah, it seems like uh, from what you're saying earlier, uh, with your dread bomb already being on the Fortizar, maybe jumping to the Fortizar, even though that's 
usually what you'd want to do wasn't ideal in that situation there. Well, the reality is the Fortizar uh, acts like two or three basically unkillable dreads in terms of DPS that it's going to continue to provide. So you never really want to put, you know, bomb dreads, which have no ability to rep damage, on a Fortizar if you can help it. But there's also no real way to kill faxes on a Fortizar, aside from, like, you know, niche, like, really outside-the-box things like long-range sniper dreads or whatever else, to kill those faxes. So it's kind of give and take. You have to be willing to go ham if you want to have that kind of engagement. And so, you know, when we dropped those 80 dreads or the 25 dreads or whatever else, uh, we were very clear about what we're, you know, willing to commit to on that fight. Right. So this was a strength check. And that's one of the things that I was trying to get across. We did live coverage on this and uh, it was well worth it. It was the biggest fight of this uh, campaign so far. Uh, but we couldn't figure out what the strategic objective was that was so worth it. And then, uh, as you said, it was a strength check, and that's what we were looking for. Is this? Uh, we've seen these two groups come together and kind of growl at each other. We've seen that twice, maybe three times, and this is the first time they actually exchanged blows. Now, what um, what caused the Imperium from? It's hard for you to know, I suppose, unless you have spies. But what caused the Imperiums to basically say? We're not up for this today. Like what kinds of problems were they having or what kind of decisions did they, uh, what kind of disadvantages were they facing? So from our understanding, they had kind of a, a battle plan, let's say, of they were going to jump in, they were going to deploy their fighter bombers, they were going to get dread bombed, they were going to PDS, and then they were going to all warp off to the Keepstar. And then they were going to use the fighters they left behind to murder his own dreads. That was their battle plan. And when the PDS part of the plan or the warp out plan didn't go well, they uh, they just said, "Okay, we're we're calling it." And uh, to me, that's that's my understanding of why they made the choices they made. Did you hear anything about their uh, communications not working? The lag was terrible on their actual. Oh yeah, yeah. They they had uh, a ton of issues apparently with their mumble server. Uh, like I, I, I'm not tracking the issues. Like I know they hit some issues, but um, yeah, they're not uncommon when you start putting a couple thousand people on your uh, servers that aren't usually used to handling that many. So, yeah, I heard some people say that Horde Mumble was having issues, but it it, it wasn't giving me any issues. So I guess it wasn't as bad as they were suffering. Well, I mean, if anybody's experienced in dealing with those type of issues, you'd think the Imperium would be the probably one of the most experienced alliances in the game, right? Of dealing with... Uh, well, sometimes it's just type. not something within your control, right? I, I think it was right. an IFP failure, or I can't remember what exactly was the cause, but, you know, it was just... You know, when it comes to that kind of thing, sometimes you just aren't the guys in control. So, uh, some technical problems. Uh, you think some strategic... Um issues uh their plan wasn't going uh, as it should have been so they withdrew here's my question for a collision of this scale they seem to get a lot of people out isn't that something of a victory for them uh to be able to save as many as they did they saved two vendettas they lost one um but i, I believe one was tackled how easy is it to extract in these big fights these days well if you're on your your own fortizar or keepstar it's actually extremely easy to extract um but if you're in the middle of space it's impossible so uh the the ability to sit on a structure that auto tethers you and at the same time can usually clear all bubbles that aren't hector bubbles almost instantaneously uh makes extracting pretty easy usually so uh there, there's some definite advantages to it which are advantages we, we knew they had going into the fight, you know, so we were willing to take the fight, giving them those tactical advantages. And right. that's why armor timers get more fights than hull timers. That's one of the main reasons why. Explain that a bit. So if this was a hull timer, when we finished the timer, the Fortizar would explode and all of the super capitals that were tethered on the structure would die. Uh, so in this case, 
when we finished the armor timer, all of the super carriers that were still remaining on the structure were just there. They're still there. They're tethered. There's nothing we can do to them. So it basically ensures that you have a clean exit on an armor timer. Right. Um, do you expect then a final fight for this Fortizar, or will they let the whole timer go? It's my expectation they'll let the whole timer go. Yeah. I don't know why they would fight over it again. No, no, no. Like, as I said, this Fortizars are worthless. I mean, maybe they fight for it again. I'm unable to predict some of the strange decisions the Imperium makes uh, pretty consistently, it seems. But uh, I don't know. Anything's possible. Well, how happy are you guys about this victory here? Oh, I mean, we're we're ecstatic, right? Like, you know, <laughs> when's the last time anybody killed 17 super carriers? Like, that's a that's a pretty big, it's a pretty huge uh, feed, and it's like it's not just the the isk. It never is in these kind of battles in a war. It's about the morale, the enthusiasm, the energy it instills, like it, the experience for the pilots. Like, there, there's so much value in these fights especially ones where it doesn't take the entire night um i I just can't express how you know pumped we are for it especially when you know it's like we killed 800 and we lost 380 or whatever like that's a that's a pretty it's pretty clear victory that nobody can spin away right so yeah um, well from uh, from what i've been hearing today that everybody had a good time on the imperium side that they had some communication problems, but whatever. Uh, they uh, lost, you know, only 18 or 16 super carriers, Nixes mostly. And in Delve, you know, I've heard that you could buy a 10 pack of Nixes. Like, that wasn't a joke. It actually, there has been a 10 pack of Nixes uh, sold out there because they made so many. As opposed to even that- making Titans, they made a bunch of super carriers. Well, I mean, that's historical truth, right? But not current truth. Nobody can buy a 10-pack. Well, I mean, maybe you can buy a 10-pack of Nixes, but you're not buying them at, you know, 10 billion, 10 billion NISC anymore. You know, the average supercarrier, even in Dell, is still in the 13 to 14 range, I imagine. And when you throw in, you know, the full armor fit, the full fighter bomber layout, you know, the pod, like all this stuff adds up. Like super carriers are not cheap just because of the hull. They're cheap because you have to put 3 billion isk in just ammunition in them in the fighter bombers. You have to usually have like Centum A type, uh, you know, uh, hardeners. You've got three tr- Tech 2 Trimarks. You've got Tech 2 FSUs. Like the, the fits for these things are a massive component of their price factor as well. And overall, like, I mean, they can, you know, say what they want about what a super indelve costs. The value of a super indelve is no different than the value of a super anywhere else. And when you lose 17 of them, it's no different than Tess losing 17 or Horde losing 17. Your your ability to replace them might be the same, but by no means is uh, it any different when it comes to you know, the actual value the asset provides. You know, it's it's that difference between uh I'm trying to think of a good example. I'll get back to you. Okay. Well the the point is it's not anything uh that you can just shrug off. But um we've been hearing how much money is in their pockets, how much money is returned since they blew the horn of Gondor. Uh we've even seen some money uh, on the monthly economic report. Uh, maybe it's not money, but it's resources that you need in order to build these things. But if they built such a big cash out of them, like how much? How much have you really wounded this group? Are we gonna? Are, do you expect to see uh, them think twice about anything for this? Is it like how should we consider this fight in the grand scheme of things? Well, I think first off, it's going to make them more cautious. It's going to instill a chink in their armor when it comes to their you know belief in their invincibility all of a sudden the imperium not only can lose a super fight but have lost a super fight i think you will find that you know their pilots will be demotivated for a few days and ours will be motivated which will create momentum 
and I think you know this uh, this represents a, a tactical improvement or a tactical growth that you know we'll see how they kind of um, innovate on. All right. Okay, thanks for really stick around. We're gonna have more. Uh, that was the battle uh, yesterday. Huge battle in nine forty nine Tac U over Fortizar, but that wasn't actually what the real fight was. It was more of a strength test. It looks like, oddly enough, test came out ahead along with Horde and their allies, all in the uh, Anaconda Coalition. Uh, they came out with the victory and uh, what about their last strategy the uh making you have to stay there for an additional hour uh to kill a simple fortizar isn't that um i don't know a bad sign for you guys that this structure grind through delve is going to take a long time <laughs> no um uh, yeah they, they they definitely suicided 300 interdictors to make it take an extra hour uh, on our extract, but two thirds of that we would have spent there anyways, just trying to get the dreads out of siege and off the field. And like, don't get me wrong, they, they added some time 10, 20, 30 minutes, but you know, they fed 300 interdictors in the process. And there, there's effective waterboarding and then there's ineffective waterboarding. And I, I definitely think this falls into the category of highly ineffective waterboarding. Yeah. All right, well, grats on that win. I think you're pretty happy with it. We'll, we'll assume that it is. Let's look at something that is uh, related. This is activity numbers. We'll see if we can bring these up. Yeah, and they have shown a real interesting uptick in activity. So have you. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that. Uh, this is, again, a list of activity based on active characters on Z Killboard. And if we look at it, there's a giant uptick there. I think it is 14% from two weeks ago. That's an increase for Goon Swarm Federation. Uh, not necessarily um, initiative. They only went up 1.6, but Goon Swarm shot way up. Uh, then again, you went up about 5.5% too. Is that the horn there, or is that uh, some actual momentum? Or do you think people are just now up for showing up since you guys are now in Quarius. I think that's a whole lot of armor super carriers that haven't been on a kill mail in three months. What's that mean? Honestly. So all of the armor super capital pilots that got on a dread kill mail or whatever else last night, that's 150, 200 of them. Uh, that's pro what I'm suggesting is that's the first time they've gone on a kill mail for many of them uh, in weeks or months, right? Which means that all of a sudden that's one more active per person. Oh, I see. Now they count, whereas before they were left off the active uh, Z kill. Yeah, right. But you would admit that that's a pretty big spike there. I mean, people for the Imperium are uh, sure. coming back or showing up on the Z kill board. Yeah, absolutely. And what do you account for test making a, an uptick there? is almost exactly where we always are we always hover within that zone we're highly uh regulated high, very steady very stable and we just you know we hover up and down 10 percent, and you know, that's that's how we kind of roll I, I wish you know some of our titan pilots would have gotten a chance to get on some kill mouse last night and it would have been even higher right so that's right i don't think we talked about that but you had like 1500 sitting in uh p -Tac z yeah that is a lot of uh, reserves. Well, we had two more Titan fleets, two more Dread fleets, and some other stuff. And you know, it's uh, we had lots of cards left to play uh, before the fold, and uh, obviously we were uh, sad we didn't get to play with them. Yeah, you assessed both situations. Um, Imperium moved their Titans from DTAC W over to K TAC six K, I think. And that's a midpoint for them when they go into Quaria. So they were getting themselves into position to drop Titans. You were ready to drop Titans. Assessing the numbers, how badly did you have them outnumbered? A bit. No. I don't I, I don't wanna, you know. Play that you don't want to show that card? Well the thing is we never had to undock our Titans in any real meaningful way, right? So the only uh 
data points the Imperium got was, you know, spies looking in fleets, which is not good or reliable data. Where we got oh. to watch them mid, so, you know, all the data cards are in our hand, I guess you could say. And obviously, we're not going to give those up for free. Yeah, now that's a very interesting point. So you actually don't even want to have them undocked to be counted. Not if we don't have to. Yeah. Oh, interesting. I hadn't thought of that. All right. Um, on to another fight that happened. Let's see if this is the kill mail. Which kill mail am I looking at? Yeah, this is a different fight. Manixar, what's this fight about? This is the 9CG6 that just happened. I believe this was over some structures in that system. Yeah. Uh, including a Moro a, Fortizar, a Fortizar, and a Tatara. Right, yeah. Including a uh, faction for it. So uh, I wasn't there. Uh, Billy probably has more information on this as well. Uh, is this the 9CG fight? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, so we were out reinforce uh, Horde and Test and Legacy and some others were out reinforcing. There's a Tatara and a Fortizar and a Morio Fortizar in 9CG. And we were out reinforcing them. Uh, Goons came in with a Sacrilege fleet under Laz and I believe a Ferox fleet uh, that bridged in basically as the fight was over. Uh, the Sacrilege just got hammered pretty hard and uh, the fight ended. We reinforced the structures. Uh, nothing too crazy. Yeah, this has uh, a lot fewer players involved here. It looks like 600. Uh, it was mostly about 100, ooh, 400 versus 200. So it looks like you're t uh, the two battle reports I've seen, you've got them two to one on numbers, at least in the sub cap arena. I don't know what the capitals look like. Yeah, uh, that's probably not inaccurate. And it's only going to spiral too, right? As you win more victories, you know, people want to log in more as you lose more victory as you lose more fights people log in less so as long as we keep winning our numbers will keep going up as long as they keep losing their numbers will keep going down and uh hopefully we can reach a point where uh we get them towards you know a critical failure so was there any strategic value to this system uh, it's, just for, it's, just, it's just for it's just cleanups i mean a morio fortizar is always a juicy target right there's only 64 of them left in the game at this point Ooh. and uh, they are uh, certainly Certainly interesting little things. Well, I keep telling people you might want to invest in these uh, faction forts because they're getting less and less every uh, every one of these wars that happen. Let's have a look at that close up once we... Uh... Oh, no. There, there's... Good swarm instead. Last, last I checked, there's no shortage of people that'll sell them to you. Uh, I can't seem to get to the link from here. Otherwise, I would show you that. All right. Um, yeah, those are the rare ones that... Yeah, the Morios yeah. are the highest rarity by far. Yeah. What's that what's that one go for? Did you say? Don't know off the top of my head. I, my suspicion is somewhere in the 80 actually I'm in Gita. Morio. Are they sold on the open market in Gita? Usually there's one on perimeter market. Ah. All right. Well he looks that up. Uh again, this fight just happened not that long ago, nine CG. That's also in Aquarius, where most of the fighting is happening. Let's take a quick look at Aquarius. Um, there isn't one on the perimeter market, but there's one that's sold for 60, and another sold for, looks like 62 here, um, a few months ago. So, you know, there's there's a little bit of historical data, but uh, obviously price is dependent on demand, and certainly uh, there's going to be more opportunities to see these things die, which means rarity goes up as people leave the game. There's fewer and fewer. Yeah. You have, it looks like, quite a few iHubs that are being reinforced. Uh, does that worry you in any way? Is that something you fight back? Inquiries? Yeah. Unless I'm reading this no. wrong. I, I know we have some troll toasting going on, like, Esoteria and around the area, like, but um, not really. In your like, opinion, Aquarius is rather pacified, at least uh, true Aquarius? Um, yeah, I think that's an accurate summation. Uh, we're just in the cleanup phase, consolidation, just working on getting everything nice and uh, nice and tidy so we can have uh, clean back lines or as clean as we can get, moving towards jump bridges and sino jammers in the region and preparing for, you know, the Siege of Delve. 
All right, so let's have a look at something else that involves you, which is great that you're here because we can ask you about this, and that is the invasion that's happening in, uh, I guess it's Sinclair Zone, right? Let's see, there is, yes. uh, yeah, right over here, a system called Ignoiton that is special to you because you have a Keepstar in it. It's a low sec system, and this is the sister Keepstar of the Tranquility Trade Center. This is the Tranquility Rebel Tower. Yep. Are you, uh, how do these invasions affect you? Uh, well, I've, I've been tr trying to get a brief today on how exactly the mechanics work. My understanding is that if the Eden Calm wins, then there's a possibility of Sino Jammers and all kinds of other stuff. So we're not super thrilled on that idea. If the trig wins, nobody really knows what's going to happen. So we're not really thrilled on that idea. So we're just kind of aiming with the Tranquility Rebel Tower to get a a draw, I guess you could say. And so anybody trying to run missions there, uh, we've put a bounty out for them. So get, kill somebody trying to run missions, uh, get reward. Um, and, oh, how know, much is that bounty? 30% Z kill. So if somebody takes their 500 mil tango out there trying to run uh, sites, you kill them, you get 200 mil. Or 200? Uh, my math might be bad. But 150. So that's for anybody that turns in basically those uh, kill reports to you. Yeah. You'll pay them a, a percentage of what they killed. Yeah, uh, nobody's really doing it right now because there's already like pirate groups in the area hunting doing the exact same thing. I told them, and they were already set up to like kill anybody doing sites in the area. So it's uh, suffice it to say, it's become a pretty effective dead zone. Interesting. So you're really suppressing, uh, you're suppressing the um, invasion on both sides. Yeah, we're just trying to do business. We're just trying to, you know, stay out of this. Uh, you know, the commanders need to come. Great people, commanders of the force of Triglov. Uh, you know, they, they're kind of <laughs> those uh, guerrilla heroes. I, I've heard good things about them, too. We're trying to just keep a nice, easy, even keel, supply both sides, you know, stay out of trouble, and provide uh, excellent uh, services to both. Uh, and obviously that means that we just want to, uh, you know, stay out of uh, the conflict as much as we can. Interesting. So uh, the uh, the financial interests of this giant conglomeration wants to keep the peace so you have a lot of mercenaries out ready to uh, kill people who are trying to move it one way or the other. It's very interesting. I don't think we've seen that ever. That's cool. All right. Definitely, definitely interesting. Yeah. With that being said, regarding the bounties, for the moment they're up, they probably won't be up tomorrow. We'll see. So it depends how it goes because um, we're going to try to have to maintain a balance, I'm told, between set... <laughs> trying to understand these mechanics when, when you don't do them is a little difficult. But my understanding is I have to keep it between 75% on both sides so it doesn't go into Luminality or Fortress. And uh, so if Eden Calm starts winning it naturally, then the Triggs will get to run it. And if Triggs get to run, you know, if it starts going in Luminality, then Eden Calm gets to run it. <laughs> and I'll just <laughs> make sure there's bounties on whatever side is appropriate i guess so you have Not to keep it balanced yeah that's yeah. that's interesting you have to keep it balanced huh. i don't know this is the weird like this is the last thing i want to be involved in i'm not gonna <laughs> lie that's so weird uh but i love all the dynamics here like you know you have uh, a, con a conglomerate of uh trade interests not interested in one side or the other but uh, the idea of uh, suppressing them both or having them suppress each other equally. That's a, it's fascinating. Neat dynamic. All right, cool. Well, those, those are the war uh, stories that we have today and the uh, also uh, some of the more interesting stuff in high sec. Do you guys have anything that you uh, looked up today? I don't have anything uh, today, no. Yeah, Gergorn, Gergorn, you seen anything interesting? Uh, I haven't really seen anything else. Uh, the main thing I've been following was the 49 tack fight. 
Yeah. Uh, I'll just give you a quick weather report. It's uh, same as yesterday. Essentially, these things move only every 24 to 48 hours. So some of them are in the same place. I just want to caution you, if you are in Vail, there are two storms there that look like uh, close to overlapping even, which would be very interesting. And if you're in Providence, there are two storms in Providence. So watch yourself there as well. Uh, for now, that's everything. We want to thank Billy for showing up today and giving us some insight from one side of the conflict. Appreciate it, Billy. Anytime. And we will see you tomorrow. Stay tuned for a raid uh, for INN. Thank you.